Luke chapter 17, we are continuing in our study of the parables of Jesus. And this is one where uh, I, when I looked at different lists to get the chronological order, because we're kind of going through these in, as best guess, uh, order that, they, that Jesus actually told them, this is one that some of the lists actually uh, skipped. I don't know why. I know it doesn't have quite the same format as some of the other parables. He doesn't say it is like a man who, uh, but it is a parable. But I, I thought that was interesting that they skipped it. And then the more I looked at it, the more I thought, well, maybe they skipped it for the same reason the rest of us skip it, right? We don't read this passage often. We don't quote Luke 17, 10 very often. Uh, when I was an AIMS student, one of my teammates suggested this be the header of our newsletter, uh, Luke 17, 10. We are but unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. And so that was our, our header on our newsletter. And it was meant to be there so that the attention would go, as we reported what God was doing and the work we were involved in, that the attention would go in the right place, not to us, but to the Lord. That's what my teammate brought up and why he wanted that there. And so we thought that was good, and, and we used that during that time. It's a good passage to remember. It's one that challenges us, but it's also one that we really, if we're honest, we, we either don't know because preachers didn't like it and never taught it, and Sunday school teachers didn't like it and never taught it, or, you know, we, we don't know it because we don't like it and never read it, never memorized it, but we need it. We need it badly. We need it as Christians. We need it as members of this particular congregation. We need it as the church in our world. We need to remember who we are, why we are, and to whose glory we do what we do. So thanks for the songs about praising God because that is the focus of all of it. It's all about, this is about Jesus. It's not about us. It's not about me. And it's a mindset that we need to have, not just when we come to worship, though we need it desperately when we come to worship. If we start thinking worship is all about us, we start getting picky and crabby and they didn't sing the songs I liked and they didn't sing them fast enough or they didn't, he didn't talk the way I like or that was the wrong translation. I used this translation. We just find ways to complain as if the reason we came together was to grade one another, which is absolutely not the reason that we come together. In the passage I read earlier in the call to worship, Galatians chapter 6, and I'm sorry I fumbled over that. What, I have trouble reading every now and then. I, I have trouble reading. That's not the problem. I have trouble tempering my eyeballs. My eyes tend to go three lines ahead of my mouth, and you know what I mean. Some of you might have the same problem, uh, and, and it's really bad. My eyes are ahead of my mouth. My mouth is ahead of my brain, and you can see the train wreck that ensues. You've seen it. You've recorded it. It's out there on the Internet for all to see from time to time. It just happens. So I still stumbled over it, so I'm going to explain it again. In that passage, Paul says that one of the things that we need to remember is that we don't measure ourselves against anybody else. He says you measure yourself, compare yourself to yourself, not to your brother, not to your sister. So as we look at the topic we're going to look at today, that's really important. We're going to look at the servant's heart and the servant's attitude. And when we talk about servanthood, it's really tempting to look at everybody else and say, well, you know, I did this, so why aren't they doing that? And I would have done this, and why aren't they doing that? And to, and to start comparing. Or my grandpa did this, and so why doesn't your grandpa do that? Or, you know, whatever. We just, we measure and we compare, and it's never ourselves against ourselves. It's always, is everybody living up to my expectations? I mentioned this the other day online. I don't think I mentioned it here, but there's a maybe I did. Maybe it was actually in last week's sermon where I mentioned that uh, it's attributed to Shakespeare, but he didn't actually say it. That expectations are the enemy of joy. Where I expect something out of people, I expect a certain level of service out of people, I expect a certain thing out of people. And then when they don't do it, they don't measure up to my expectation. This is really destructive in a marriage. Because you'll have sometimes a spouse who has expectations of a spouse that the spouse doesn't even know they exist. So how could they possibly live up to them? And that breaks it up. And it, it ends in divorce or it ends in 50 years of misery. It, it's never good when that's, when that's what we do. And that's born of the same we're comparing one to another instead of one to ourselves. So Paul says in Galatians 6 that when you look at this, you need to look at yourself, okay? So this is what we're going to do this morning. We're only going to do self-exams. No one else. 
I made a covenant with myself and with God a long, long time ago, by the way. This is something I should probably tell you because it's kind of a covenant with you as well. I never, ever preach a sermon about some particular person who's in the room, okay? And it's, it's always going to be, I will preach what's in Scripture. And if that hits people in the room, well, then that's, you know, as my good friend Lawton Langford always says, James will never step on your toes if you didn't put your foot there. Think about it. Think about it. Just don't put your foot there and you don't have to worry about it. But it's true. I, I also joke a lot of times that I preach to myself, and I do do that a lot. I preach to myself, and y'all just get to listen in. That happens a lot too. So as we go through this, it's only self-exams. We look at ourselves. We measure ourselves against where we've been. Paul's point is, when you do this, you set yourself free from some things. And we're going to talk about setting ourselves free from some things several times this morning. You set yourself free from those expectations that aren't met by other people. You don't know it, but you're enslaved to those things. Your relationships suffer from those things. You are mad at people who don't even deserve for you to be mad at them because they don't even know that you've got a thing that you're expecting. You know, you see what I mean? It sets you free from all of those pitfalls within a relationship built on all of these expectations that God didn't set and judgments we make of one another as As we see, are they measuring up to what I expect? Now, why do we do that? There are lots of reasons, but maybe the number one is because it's the same trap the Pharisees fell into. It's easier to judge someone outside of our skin than the one who's inside. It's more comfortable. It's easier and it feels better. We feel self-righteous if we can judge how somebody else is performing rather than look in the mirror and deal with what's there right but there's another freedom that comes when Paul says I want you to compare yourself with yourself he's not assuming that you're a failure we might make that assumption well I don't want to do that because I know yeah I know I get that I beat myself up all the time but Paul's not making that assumption we're the ones making that assumption or I'm the one making that assumption When you compare yourself with yourself, you may see, you know, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have done that, but now I do. 10 years ago, I might have been really selfish about that, but now I'm not. I think Paul assumes there'll be some growth there. That's what he's been talking about is our growth through the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I think he assumes that when you compare yourself with yourself, you will have reason to praise God for how much work he has done and the Spirit has done on you, that you're better than where you used to be. And isn't that a better focus? Isn't that a better uh, use of our freedom in Christ to think about where God has brought us and where God can take us, being honest with ourselves, rather than setting ourselves up for constant disappointment in expectations other people didn't know we had but we have and then we're measuring them up you see what I mean and we always expect everybody else to perfectly copy Jesus while we give lots of room for our own flaws don't we that's just human nature that's not you know beating ourselves up on that either that's just that's what humans do it's what we do it is a flaw something we ought to work on but it is what we do so we need to be careful so All of that just to get us into the mindset that we need to be in as Jesus teaches this parable. So let's uh, go through this. First, I want us to ask ourselves a couple of questions. And we needed to do this other first to get to these questions. Ask yourselves, why do you serve? Why do you do things for other people? If you can't answer that, if you're like, serve? Well, then it's a different sermon. I'll preach that next week and we can repent then. But why do, I'm going to assume the best that you serve people, that you're doing things for people, and I know most of you, and you are. Uh, So why do you do it? There's usually two main reasons that we do this. There are either altruistic reasons, things like love and kindness and giving honor to God. You do it because you want to please the Lord. Those are our good reasons, right? Those come from the better part of ourselves. They come from the Spirit working within us. Those are a fruit of the Spirit in our life. You could put in that parentheses, love, joy, peace, patience, and it would make sense, wouldn't it? These are the reasons we serve. Because 
I enjoy it. And you should, by the way. You shouldn't feel guilty if you enjoy serving other people. That doesn't make you selfish to enjoy that. You should gain your joy more from serving the Lord than from not serving the Lord. So that would just make sense, wouldn't it? And serving is a joyful work to do. So why do you do that? First, maybe that's your answer. I do it because I love Jesus. That's certainly the Sunday school answer, right? Because we love Jesus. Maybe that is why, though. Maybe that's why you do a lot of what you do. Praise the Lord. We're thankful for people who do that. There are other reasons sometimes that we serve. And again, do not. Here's where you're going to be tempted, okay? Because we always assume it's altruistic when it's our service. But when it's somebody else, what are we going to assume? Well, they just do that because they want... Mm, careful. Only comparing yourself with yourself, right? Okay. Sometimes we serve. As human beings, we're all guilty at some point or another. Sometimes we serve because we're selfish. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. I know the saying goes the other way, but let's be honest. And some people serve for that reason. Some people only serve for this reason. What can I get out of it? And I know that the temptation is to say, oh yeah, like so and so. Because the devil's just right there, isn't he? Trying to whisper in your ear who, who that might be. Comparing ourselves only with ourselves. Do we ever do that? Do you do that? Sometimes serve just because, well, it'll get me this. I don't want to do it, but it will get me this. It'll get me attention. It'll get me a pat on the back. It'll get me whatever. What kind of service are you committed to in your life? You need to be committed to serving, but is it for the right reasons? Now, you might ask, do motives matter? If I'm doing the right thing, does it really matter why I do it? Well, yes. We like to say no. We like to say no because then we can keep our wrong motives and we don't have to, we don't have to grow. But motive does matter, and motive matters ultimately because it determines our destination. Why I'm doing something determines what I'm aiming at. What I'm aiming at determines where I go. So, if I'm doing this for selfish reasons, I don't end up at Jesus. I don't end up at the kingdom of God. I don't end up at people bringing glory to God. I end up at either people only giving glory to myself, in which case Jesus says, I hope you enjoy it, it's all you'll ever get. He said that. Or we end up, I did all that work and they never even said nothing. You know you said it, right? Everybody, everybody in this room has said that at some point. I did all of that and nobody said anything. Well, why were you doing it? Oh. Oh. Isn't that something? Our motives can be pretty easily detected, can't they? And our motives aren't always where they ought to be. If my motive was to bring glory to God, well, if nobody else praises God, guess who can? Ah, thank you, God, that I got to do that. Thank you, God, that I was able to help them out. At least you can praise. But, you know, the hand pats on your own back only look foolish to everybody else and don't do much for you, right? Motive really does matter, but it matters more deeply than other people seeing through us. It matters because God sees the difference okay now with all of that I had to do that to be able to introduce you to the parable because it's going to make sense here in a second as we look at it let's read it together this comes from the NIV which is funny because I grabbed my ESV when I came out the door uh, suppose one of you has a servant plowing and looking after sheep will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field come along now and sit down to eat okay I think as Americans we read this and go yeah of course he would, right? Like our mindset is, hey, if I washed his sheep, you bet he invites me to supper, right? Who's going to thank me? Did my job. Okay. He says, do you really, this is his thing, do you really expect that? I, I don't usually like to stop in the middle of the reading, but I have to. Put aside 21st century American and Texan settings for a moment read this like you are it's, I know this is hard but read it like you're a first century Christian where this is the norm you're a servant on someone else's farm it is not yours maybe you're even a slave 
And now let's read that again. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me a while while I eat and drink, and after that you may eat and drink? Again, put the American aside for a minute. I know he's trying to shout through your ear there for a second. Put him aside. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? And all the mothers are like, well, if he's my son, he better, right? He better, he, well, I understand, but putting aside where we're coming from, look at it. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? You also, when you have done everything you were told to do. Oh, man, Jesus did, did us wrong, didn't he? He just made it about us. So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Ugh. <laughs> right? That doesn't fit with the way we think as Americans and Texans, does it? It just doesn't. There are several pain points in here. One, we'll go with the easy one first. Aren't you supposed to say thank you? Even if you're the master, he's your say. Why didn't you say thank you? I get it. I get it. But that wasn't the culture. You do your job. You get it done. You move on to the next task. Did you notice that part? You've been out watching the sheep. He says uh, you're either plowing or you're looking after the sheep. You come in. What do you do? I line up and I have him thank us all for the wonderful job of sheep watching and plowing that we've done today. No, there's none of that. I take a bow. Oh, I am a great plower, yes. No, there's none of that. Instead, you come in and, and you're sitting there expecting your great big thank you and the master says, all right, now clean yourself up and get dinner ready. Okay, little aside, how many of you did not hear master servant when I said that? How many of you are like, well, that sounds like my dad? Hmm? All right, you clean yourself up and go get the dinner ready, right? That's exactly what some of you heard. I know some of you heard that. And this is kind of the way that that is. You move on to the next task. No pomp, no circumstance, no Emmy awards for your great performance. None of that. Just, all right, it's time for supper. And you go, all right, what are we having? <laughs> the master looks at you like, we? Who is this we? Is this you and the mouse in your pocket? I want my dinner ready. Five minutes. Let's go. And you go, well, that's just not nice. That was the culture. More importantly, Jesus says some things are still that way. Well, they're not either. Yes, some things are still that way. Which things? Jesus would tell us, now let's go back further. Will he thank the servant for what he was told to do? That sounds like a parent. You know, every now and then kids get, you know, that thing in there. Well, aren't you going to? You ever fight for, some, for a, a raise in your allowance as a kid? Why do, so-and-so gets paid for mowing the lawn. Why don't I get paid for mowing the lawn? That's a quote of a young boy named Jimmy in West Texas. I used to know that kid. And... Jimmy didn't get the answer he wanted, you know, and uh, yeah, it's a little bit like that. There's a Seinfeld episode where this guy always talks about himself in the third person, and his name is Jimmy. He's like, Jimmy's getting upset. Oh, Jimmy didn't get upset, but mom and dad did. They did the same speech that I would do if I got the same thing, right? And who do you think? Ah, here we go with the list of receipts, parental receipts, right? Well, let's sit down and look at that. How are we even on our tabs, right? There would be that sort of a thing. And he says, some of you think you're serving of the Lord because that's what he's really talking about. You think about that in the same way. You're thinking, well, but God owes me, and these people owe me, and the elders owe me, and, and, and why not? There it goes again, right? He says, but you did what you were supposed to do. Depending on your motive, is this good or bad, what he's saying? If our motive is out of our faithfulness, we get what Jesus is saying. See? So when you're doing your test, see how these words fall on you. If our word is out of our faithfulness, this doesn't bother us. We go, yeah, God called me to do this, and I wanted to do it, and I did it. I don't need pomp and circumstance. But if our motive is from the flesh, where's my, where's my, where's my, where's my, where's my, echoes all through this story. And Jesus is telling this story for a really good reason. 
We haven't gotten to context yet. Uh, I want to look at verse 10 one more time. We're going to have this memorized by the time we're done. So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. He tells his disciples, this is the attitude that all kingdom people are to have. God, I just did what you called me to do. I don't need all that. We know that our treasure lies ahead. We keep trying to get it paid up front, don't we? Our treasure, when he talks about laying up treasure for yourselves in heaven, this is what he's talking about. Don't seek your glory now. The glory comes later. Don't seek the reward now. The reward comes later. Right now, we have work to do. And we don't need to sit around patting each other's backs. We need to get on to the next task. When an ant dies, other ants immediately jump in and take their job. Just jump in. They just do it. They instinctively, innately, just jump in and do it. God said, consider the ant through his servant Solomon. Consider the ant. Look at how they work. I think he's trying to teach us some humility. Ants don't pat each other's back. They serve. They know their mission, and they stay on it. And this is what happens when we take Jesus' attitude to heart. Now, why is he telling this story? Context. We always have to remember the context. In the context, he's talking to his disciples about how to live and to work and to serve, and in preparing them, he's getting really close to the cross, he's preparing them for what their kingdom mission will be. And he needs them to know it's not about you. There's something bigger happening here. It's a big picture issue. And we keep our focus all too often on the little things and the little rewards and the little reasons for doing things. He says, look at the big picture. They have been arguing already a couple of times about who's going to be the greatest, who's going to be the servant. I know we're all going to be servants, but somebody has to be the servant leader. And that's the way that people act. In fact, if you look at books on servanthood in Christian bookstores, most of them don't talk about real servanthood. They talk about servant leadership because we don't want to just be a servant. I want to be the chief leader, right? But that's wrong. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. And so Jesus starts trying to correct their attitude, and he tells several parables on this attitude of having a servant's heart and it not being about us. And so this is just kind of in the middle of these. It's one more time. He's like, we've got to circle this block, guys, because y'all still aren't getting it. And so he goes back around and says, you know what it would be like? It would be like if you were a servant. If you were a servant, you don't come in and expect the master to bow down to you. You keep serving the master and you realize your place. He uses a phrase, by the way, let me go back. He uses that phrase in verse 10, we are unworthy servants. I looked this up. I thought, you know, a modern American audience would like to look at the Greek and know that unworthy just means, you know, unfinished, immature. Surely it doesn't really have a negative connotation because this is what we do. We go find a Greek word that, you know, doesn't, it softens it up a little bit. Oh, no, 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 no. The word he uses here for unworthy, this is the soft interpretation, okay? This is as soft as the NIV could make it. It's worthless, youthless, no good. It's the same kind of phrase that he uses about salt when it loses its saltiness. Absolutely useless, useless and worthless. Maybe youthless for some of us, I don't know. But just absolutely, those are not the same thing. Uh, just absolutely worthless. So we couldn't even soften it. Why would he say that? Because he's got a bunch of people with big heads, full of themselves, vying for positions of being in charge. And he says, guys, there's only one in charge. It's Jesus, not any of you. It's God the Father, not any of you. It's the Spirit, not any of you. And he's trying to get them off their high horse, okay? And so he's teaching them through all of these stories the proper attitude to have, which is just, God, I'm nothing compared to you, okay? I'm nothing compared to you. I'm not the one who would need the glory. You're the one who should receive the glory. I'm not the one to be served. You're the one who ought to be served. I'm not the one who deserves laud and praise. That would be you. Okay? That's all he's trying to get us to, is to that attitude. Jesus doesn't see you as worthless in the strictest sense. 
But sometimes we have to remind ourselves that we're just not all that, but God is. And he's the one we actually serve. And his are the motives that we actually need to follow. And his are the reasons that we need to have for that service. And so we do a bit of a recalibration. That's what he's doing with them. Uh, some of you have GPS maps. In my car, an old car I had, I don't remember which one it was. I think it was the, yes I do. It's the one I had when we got married, the red one. Had a little compass up there, electronic compass. It was an old Chrysler uh, New Yorker. And you had to every now and then recalibrate, and actually you still have to do this on some cars, but I bet nobody does it. Uh, you have to recalibrate those compasses. And the way you would do that is go find a parking lot. It was in the manual. You'd go to the parking lot, and you'd drive around in a figure eight until the thing stopped flashing, and then your compass was back to normal, and then your north, south, east, west was all set up again. Later, when I got the little GPS thing, uh, before the phones had Google Maps, before Google Maps existed, had the GPS thing uh, screen, you had to do the same thing with it, only instead of a parking lot, sometimes you had, to, you had to sit there in your car as people are driving by doing this in a figure eight. You look like an idiot. You know, you kinda, you know, there's no way around it. And so that's what, of course, you did when you're driving your Chrysler around the parking lot for no reason. The figure eight would know. At least if you set out orange cones, they think you're t- taking like a DMV test. No cones. You're just an idiot in the parking lot in a Chrysler. You, nobody cares. But you had to do that to recalibrate so your measurements are right and so that you know true north. Christians have to get their true north right. That's Jesus, isn't it? Jesus is our true north, the one who determines where we go, what we do, and and whether or not we're doing right and traveling right in this world. And every now and then we have to stop and ask ourselves these questions. Is it Jesus I'm serving? Is it for his glory that I'm serving? Is it for his purpose that I'm serving? So that we end up in the right place. It's not a negative thing. It's a very positive thing. It's I want to do this right. And you do. Everybody in this room wants to do this right. You want to serve the Lord and serve the Lord well. That's why you're here this morning. And so every now and then we just had to stop and say, okay, let's make sure that we're headed in the right direction and doing the right thing. We're about to start a new year. We want to be good. We recalibrate. We make sure that we're where we ought to be. It's kind of an appropriate thing right before we get to Christmas, which is just the ultimate recalibration of He is why this all matters. He is why we do what we do. So we recalibrate and make sure we have our true north. So we have Luke 17.10 as a way to recalibrate and ask ourselves, why have I been serving? Was it about me or is it about Jesus? When you answer that question, okay, maybe it was about me. Well, then you just correct it. It's not a big deal. It's just a course correction. I say it's not a big deal. I mean, it's an eternity big deal. But it's actually not a big deal in the sense of, can you do that? Sure. I can correct my attitude, and I can fix that. That's not some immovable object. God can work on this in me. We can get it. Okay. Job 41.1, little reminder of why we do things. Who has first given to me? This goes to our motives again. Who has first given to me that I should repay him? God asked Job this. What have you done for me that I owe you this great big and here is James, the Lord said. Really? Really? Like we all really ultimately kind of want to be the Wizard of Oz. And Jesus is the ultimate pulling back the curtain guy who exposes us for what we are. Why do you do this? God says to Job, you think you have that much to give to me? Do I owe you something? What do I owe you? This is kind of that Luke seventeen ten. I'm just, an, I'm just a worthless servant. God owes me nothing. We kind of have to get there. I say, well, I don't like that. So, it's true. God owes you nothing. In truth, the church owes you nothing. Your spouse owes you nothing. Well, James, that's not the best sermon I ever heard. Hmm? I didn't know you that either. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't know you. I owed you nothing. But it's the truth. So then, why would we want to say that truth out loud? Why would we want to look in the mirror and say, nobody owes me anything? Because it sets you free. You've been judging your life by what everybody owed you. And everybody comes up short. But if life was never about what they owed you, guess what also stops? People stop coming up short in your vision of them. 
And then you can enjoy them for who they really are. You can enjoy them instead of someone who owes me. You can enjoy them as blessings to you. God, thank you that you put them in my life. You didn't have to. Thank you for my wife. You gave me better than I deserved. Thank you for this church. It's a blessing I don't deserve. Thank you for Jesus. He did what I never deserved. It sets you free. It also multiplies your understanding of the blessings that God has given you. No, God doesn't owe you anything. And yet he has lavished you with love and grace and forgiveness anyway. Anyway. It's incredible when you start to think about it. Matthew chapter 5, this is one of my favorite verses in this regard. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father. Recalibration. Who's it all about? Go do your deeds. Let people see what you're doing. But don't walk around and say, look at me, look at me, look what I can do. It makes you look like a dork. I did that just for you. You see how much I love you? I just was a dork on the internet just for you. Just for you. But to, to whose glory do we do what we do? God's. This should be our goal. Whatever you do, however you serve, whatever it is you do to help somebody. By the way, they still need riser help right after church. Opportunities. And so just giving them to you. I, just, I saw CB. I thought I'd better remind everybody. And... Who gets the glory? God. Somebody will go home saying, God, thank you for that. Done. Mission accomplished. Right there. The second somebody says, thank you, Lord, our mission is done. And isn't that actually better? You want people to always thank you, or would you rather find out there were people thanking God for you? One sure lasts a whole lot longer and runs a whole lot deeper than the other. And you might not even ever know until you arrive and collect your treasure that you've laid up in heaven, which will be in the form a lot of, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I've been thanking God for you forever. And won't that be incredible? One last verse, I think. <laughs> I think, better be. Uh, Matthew 6, 1, same context as the last verse. He says this, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others. Motive, see, motive to be seen by them. Now, didn't he just say back here, that you're supposed to be the light of the world? Yes. Showing people how to live for the Lord and to his honor and to his glory versus all about me, right? That's the difference. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them because if you do, what does he say? You will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So motives do matter. You get nothing for all the times that you served just to make a name for yourself. Zip. Oh, man, that means most of the stuff that happens in our world today is worthless, doesn't it? Unfortunately, it does. That's why we're called to be different, to do it for a whole different reason, to God's honor with completely different motives and set free from all of that ego stuff that the world is caught up in. There was one more. Galatians 5, 13 to 15. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So how do I, you know, what's the correction? This, be humble. Do it out of motivation of love for one another and for the Lord your God. You cannot displease God doing this. Impossible. Serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he gives us a warning. If you bite and devour each other, that always comes from the motives of selfishness. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. These are your two options. This is where the two different kinds of service lead. But service to the Lord's honor, to the Lord's glory humbly and in love leads to praise. So let's stand and sing and praise the Lord together as we do.